Great to be with you all. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. This is a uh, special time for me to have an exchange with you all, and hopefully it's a meaningful time for you. I would like to thank Dr. Red Brown, the president of Wingate University, uh, Steve Poston as well. You've got some great leadership on this campus, and I'm deeply grateful that they would open up this auditorium and uh, allow us to come in here to be here. I see Christian Cano out here, candidate for Congress, a uh, member of the Democrat Party. I don't know if there's any other candidates here, but we welcome you and welcome your thoughts as we're with each other tonight. Well, we live in a country that has been very favored, a country that has been very blessed in so many ways. As I walk up those worn stone steps of the Capitol every day and I look at the dome and what that dome represents, freedom, liberty, and opportunity, unique to the world, it's our job and our responsibility to maintain those freedoms, those freedoms inside this country, those freedoms that would be preserved against such adversaries who seek our destruction. And regrettably, there are those foes that we have out there in the world today. But as well, we have challenges inside our own country. We have a nation of people who are deeply hurting, I represent eight counties. Much of it is rural, uh, farmers, those who, some of the poorest counties in North Carolina, some of the poorest counties, frankly, in the United States. And uh, our interest and our desire is to serve every person, to make sure that we can lift up the quality of life, the standard of living for everyone. Regrettably, uh, in the last decade, we've seen a real demise in that quality of life. We have not seen individuals attain uh, economic growth. We haven't seen wages go up. We haven't seen opportunity for our businesses to expand and to do greater hiring. And so while we're here and while we serve is to enact policies that free up our country. You know, America became a great country not because of a great government, but because of those freedoms. Those freedoms for an individual to go take a risk and build a business and put up his capital and grow and expand and create more and more jobs. And unfortunately, in the last uh, eight years, we've seen a decline in that. Uh, in, in the demographic group, it's been hurt the worst, and I'd be glad to, if you show me any stats, I'd be glad to look at them. But the demographic group who's been hurt the worst over the last eight years are lower income minority people. That's been a great tragedy because we haven't had an expanding economy. Now our economy has grown at a tepid 2% economic growth. This has been the only economy that never reached 3% growth since World War II. And it's because I believe of a very restricted um, factors that do not allow uh, businesses to grow. You have compliance requirements, you have regulatory requirements, and you have uh, a tax burden that has restricted our growth. We have the highest corporate tax rate of any country in the industrialized world. So very much of a disincentive for companies to come here, and many companies frankly want to relocate and go to another country. Uh, I don't like that, but in many ways I don't blame them. So we, we must address concerns of yours. Everywhere I go I hear about health care. It's collapsing. Uh, the major insurance carriers are pulling out of the market. Aetna, United, and so many others. Uh, our premiums are escalating. Our deductibles are escalating. You have a deductible of five to $10,000. Your premiums are $1,000 or more uh, a month. Uh, that's not coverage. And we need to be able to provide real coverage. We did pass what I felt was a good bill in the House. It stalled in the Senate. Uh, we need to rescue health care for the American people. Right now, they do not have health care. Uh, in North Carolina, we have one provider. We need to be able to sell across state lines. You can have more cost-effective health care like you have any other product, whether it's car insurance or whether it's a product you buy or any other service, when you have competition in the market. And we are going to have competitive markets. So that's one issue we're going to deal with. Another, of course, is our tax code lowering the tax code to expand our businesses, lowering the 
regulatory burden. You know, in North Carolina, we've lost 50% of our banks in the last eight years, since 2010. And the reason why we lost them is compliance requirements. Your small community banks have to be just as responsible to the same obligations as your large international banks. That doesn't make sense. That was part of the Dodd-Frank bill that was passed in 2009. So that small business, that small farmer, uh, that individual, that entrepreneur who's trying to build a business that, frankly, America was built on, he can't get capital today. He can't grow and expand. You know, uh, over 50% of the new jobs in this country come from small business. And yet, we have seen a real lack of those businesses forming and growing and creating jobs. And that's why we haven't had a growing economy. When we, grew, when we cut the tax burden in the 1980s, we cut the regulatory burden, we were creating 300,000 and 400,000 and 500,000 jobs a month. One uh, quarter, we grew at 7.3%. That's quite a difference of where we are today. Uh, we can do much better when we free up the American people. So those are my opening remarks. Uh, I welcome your comments. So if, if you could keep them uh, down to a minute. That's, those are our house rules. When we go to the house floor, when we speak, we get a minute. And that, frankly, will enable more people uh, to be engaged in this conversation tonight. We do have mics. And, uh, and also, let me just say, let's respect one another. <clears throat> we had some people last night from Indivisible, Indivisible who came to our meeting. I don't know if they're here tonight or not. But uh, we are uh, glad to have you. I don't know whether you're from this district or not. Uh, those last night were not. But uh, uh, Indivisible, uh, by nature, is uh, last night they didn't choose to show respect to everyone else. I hope that they will tonight. Okay, if we could start with our questions. If you just come, he'll, he'll put the mic in front and let her ask her question. I get to be first. Oh. <laughs> okay. You're fine. Um, and I'll try to keep it to a minute. Tonight I wanted to talk to you about immigration. And um, my family is military and my nephew, I told him I'd speak for him. He's been working with No One Left Behind to bring interpreters over from Afghanistan and Iraq. Two of my nephews work with interpreters and we owe them their safe return to these interpreters. Will you make an effort to increase the number of special immigrant visas so that we can bring, we've increased it to 2,500, but there are 10,000 people in the pipeline waiting to get here. And I don't want to see a recurrence of what happened in Vietnam when we left those people on the top of the embassy. And I'm very concerned about this, and I would like to know that you would support increasing the number of special immigrant visas for these men and women who have put their lives on the line for our troops. Especially yes, if you're going to leave them in Afghanistan. I, I respect everything that you just said. Uh, I would tell you that it is our commitment uh, to bring back every person who has been uh, supportive of our mission and that we can properly vet. Vetting is the key, and you can come up with an arbitrary number of how many there are, but uh, reality is uh, we have a commitment to, and through the President's uh, initiative, and through the Congress to be able to allow those who have been engaged with us to uh, be able to have a, a legal status. The other concern about immigration is that the new efforts to restrict the green card applications to an income-based and education-based is very reminiscent of what we did in the 1930s when we turned away refugees coming from Nazi Germany. And I would like to have your assurance that we would take human rights into consideration when we talk about refugees. Well, the, the commitment of this president is to do what is best for America. And uh, it's our interest to allow those who can bring in and help build our country and be uh, fully engaged uh, and be a part of it, who can play the, the, the most significant role uh, to allow them a priority to come. So I think that's our, our interest. Next question. You're on. You wanted to hit your... Oh, you holy ask. Okay. Well, um, in your introduction, you said that uh, I represent uh, a lot of uh, uh, poor constituents, right? Uh, I didn't understand. Say it again. 
In your introduction, you said that you are representing a lot of poor people. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, in my district, I do. In your district, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm wondering how exactly you are doing that. Uh, you are taking away uh, their health insurance, uh, the CBO, uh, estimated the number of people going to lose their health insurance by what was it, 20 million? I, I don't know exactly the number. And, uh, and you would use the, the tax, the expenses for health insurance to, to pay the, the top 1%. Uh, how do you explain that as uh, helping your Thank constituents? You. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> well, let's do agree on this that the current plan is faltering. The, 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 the current people don't have, let's just show respect. No, we don't, we had, our plan had been enacted. The, the status that we're in today, the current status uh, is collapsing. The markets are collapsing. Uh, let's, we're gonna have a respectful conversation. Uh, right now, as we speak, Carriers are pulling out of the market. Uh, the CEO of Aetna said this is on a death spiral. Okay? Well, you need to talk to the CEOs of the insurance companies. Uh, sir, all I'm telling you, you have uh, 40 counties that we know of already in the country who have zero carriers. Well, that's the factual. You, you can make up your facts. But what we're going to provide is health care that is, will be affordable to the American people. What the CBO score did not take into account of was the ability to market these plans across state lines to, for people to uh, be able to join up together and to buy insurance at a more cost-effective basis. It's just buying on their own, buying groups. There are ways that uh, through litigation reform that drives the prices down. 30% of the uh, tests performed by physicians today are done for defensive medicine to protect themselves from lawsuits. That drives the price up for health care. There are many factors that the CBO score did not put in their formula because it, it wasn't enacted yet. But when we enact these reforms, you're going to see a market-driven healthcare that's going to provide, like America has always done, the most cost-effective products and the most cost-effective services on the planet. Well, I know, the C I know what the CBO included, and they did not include these factors in their analysis. And also, the score was based on their 2016 numbers, and their 2017 numbers, uh, th that number was 6 million people less. What's the next question, please? I'm the chairman of the College Republicans here at Winkett, and I just wanted to thank you for being here tonight and supporting um, President Trump's initiatives to make America great again. Thank you, Caitlin. Great to have your leadership. Bright young lady, appreciate you being here. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, bear with me while I read this. I am new to North Carolina. Uh, I am a constituent. I live in Monroe, but I'm from Sandy Hook. Connecticut. Pardon? The tragedy of the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School mm -hmm. is very personal to me. Mm -hmm. It was a place of my employment, and it was also the place that my adult daughters graduated from. On 12-14, I was also an administrator of a private school in Newtown at that time. What happened that day will be forever ingrained in my mind and soul. Since that terrible day, there have been attempts to improve gun control. These attempts have not happened. Since the shooting in Newtown, North Carolina has passed bills supporting gun rights, not gun control. I want to speak to the rights of the victims of gun violence. I am against the allowance of military-grade semi-automatic assault weapons and their high-capacity magazines being in the public sector. 
These weapons of mass killing have no business in the hands of the private citizen. They are not used to hunt or protect the family or persons, as the Second Amendment so claims. At last night's town hall meeting in Matthews, you said you'd fight to protect the rights of the unborn fetus. Are you willing to fight for the right to life of the living? When are you and the other Republicans in Washington going to stand up against the NRA, National Association of Gun Rights Lobbyists, stop taking their money, and do the right thing? So that's my question to you. When are you in Washington going to do the right thing for the Thank living you. and you support gun control. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> Don't we all wish it was so simple to pass a law to uh, protect this country? There have been an inordinate number of laws passed in Chicago and other major cities around the country. They have the strictest gun laws anywhere in the country, and for that matter, the world. And uh, you have the greatest uh, crime, the greatest violence, the greatest number of murders. Uh, restricting guns has not been the answer. Frankly, um, those who want to find a gun will find a gun. Uh, what, we, what we need today is a culture that does not provoke violence. I wish that you would take your message uh, to those in Hollywood who perpetuate this problem by incorporating violence in every game of every student, every movie, every, every... Look what's happened in our country for the last 30 years. And look, look at the violence that, is, that has been perpetuated. It becomes the norm. I wish you had just as much emotion on the benefactors of the Democrat Party in Hollywood as you do uh, going after the NRA. Uh, we have a Second Amendment. It's not the first, not the third, fourth, or fifth. It's the Second Amendment to write and bear arms. And you, you gave a lot of information that, frankly, uh, does not address reality. The reality is, in our nation today, we have had an enormous number of gun laws and we haven't been able to address the problem by greater gun laws. What we've done is restrict the right for people to defend themselves. What had happened in Washington with those 24 congressmen if there hadn't been two law enforcement officers there? They'd be dead today. What would happen in, with that... What, what, would, what would happen if uh, uh, with uh, those in uh, our military bases that do not had, we're not able to have guns. The, and, and that's why individuals should be able to have the right to carry arms to defend themselves. What happened to man? One shot at a time and not automatic or one shot at a time, ma'am. Okay? In, in Paris, how many people were slaughtered? 26? That's my point. The most restrictive gun laws you could have. And what happened? You got a couple dozen dead people. It happened. And restricting gun laws won't keep bad guys from getting guns. Okay? Next question. If, if you could pass laws, with Chicago would be the safest city in the world. Next question. Uh, Chicago, throughout the region, uh, ma'am, they, they have restrictive gun laws in not just Chicago, you have them in Vermont, you have them uh, in Boston, you have many cities where you have very restrictive gun laws and it, that hasn't solved the problem. If it was that simple, I'd do it tomorrow. Okay.
Next question. No, I mean, you, I'm not going to, you come up with your, own, with your own information, your own facts. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. I'd like to build on what the young lady said. We're going to show respect. Other people are talking now. He's trying to, sir. I'd like to build on what the young lady said here. Chicago's laws don't make a bit of sense. Because you can have them, but you come in from DeKalb, you come in from Arlington Heights, you come in from McHenry, you bring guns from all over the place. Unless you have a federal law, nothing happens. Sir, bad guys get guns. They get them from across the border. They, they get them everywhere, everywhere you can find. Guns are accessible to people. And you're being very naive to think that you can fix the problem. No, the, the guns... The guns are in the market, man. There's millions of guns out there that are accessible to bad guys. You need to have the right for law-abiding people to protect themselves. And I'm not going to be one who restricts the ability for a law-abiding person to protect themselves. Okay? Okay. Next question. All right, come over here. Be fine. Yes, I'd like... I'd like to go back to health care. Um, you're the indivisible, is that right? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. I've never been to a town hall before. This is my I'm first I'm glad you're point. here. I want that right in my face. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask you, the Republicans have run on repeal and replace Obamacare for seven years. <laughs> when you had the opportunity to do it, you realize that the majority of the population did not want this repeal and replace. That's why you couldn't pass it. So tell me now, where do we go about fixing it? Because we're not going to be able to repeal it. So how do we replace? How do we fix it? Thank you for your question. <laughs> well, we passed the bill in the House. It faltered in the Senate, uh, and clearly, you have to address the legislation, address the problem for where it is today, until you come to the reality of where we are with health care today, that we have uh, escalating premiums, escalating deductibles. In North Carolina alone, it, uh, there's some people who haven't, thank you ma'am, there's okay. some people who have not accepted the premise that we have a problem. Premiums in North Carolina have gone up 176%. They're going to go up another 23% this fall that you're going to be paying. That's 200%. Uh, but let's, let's be respectful. Let's be respectful. Once, once, you, once you accept the premise that we have a faltering health care plan, what is, what's the basic way you can fix it? We have a federally managed health care that limits access to plans, doesn't have a, an choices for the American people. In all due respect, ma'am, let me answer your question. We, we are going to have competitive markets, and we're going to be able to provide to all the American people the ability to buy the insurance that you want to buy. When you go buy a car, when you go buy any product, you buy what you want to buy. You're not saying, here's your product, you buy it. And that's what we have today in our current health care plan. People are going to be able to buy the product that they want to buy. They don't have to have all the whistles and bells. You know, I'm, I'm never going to be pregnant. I don't need to have that kind of insurance. Okay? So we, we, will, be, we will be able to con convey to the American people real choices, and what they want to buy. That's going to help drive prices down. We're going to be able to uh, sell products across the state line. That will enable competition in the market. You can't do that today. Competition, open, free markets. That's what drives prices down. And we do not have that. We have a federally mandated program that uh, is never going to meet the needs of the American people as long as we restrict those options and restrict the access to, 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 to providers by just buying within your own state. There are hundreds of providers out there. There's a market that will people go after if they're given access to that market. 
And so competition, if you understand the premise of free markets, if you understand the premise of what made this country great, that's the same formula that will bring us cost-effective health care. Okay? Go ahead, please. I'll change the subject for some of us who might not cool our tempers down for a moment. Okay. Um, I have three military sons. I got this gray hair in my head for a reason. All three of my sons have been in combat. Mm -hmm. I have That's had wounded heart. sons, and I had a son who, who um, was in combat and saved quite a few of his friends. Sixteen of them were killed, mm -hmm. and he was awarded Soldier of the Year of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Bless your heart. Okay, so I'm always worried about what's going on with our military. So, um, we've been watching North Korea. And then we think, oh my goodness, what a joy. It looks like the president has calmed down North Korea and I don't have to worry about that country and my children, my sons, going there. And now all of a sudden, again on the news, is North Korea shooting off missiles toward China. And I'm worried again about my sons having to go to yet another country and be in harm's way. So um, I, I do appreciate our president saying he's not going to tell our enemies what our plans are uh, and get them prepared for us. I do appreciate that. But I kind of want to know, you know. <laughs> um, so do you have anything to settle my fears of what my sons might be facing in terms of North Korea and what the president's plan might be for that. Ma'am, thank you. Thank you for your dedication for who you are and for your family and what they do to protect this country and for the freedoms that each of us enjoy every day. And we don't, we frankly, so easy to take for granted the men and women who are out there defending those freedoms. And we are in a very unstable world. There's tremendous provocation from nation states, uh, including North Korea and Iran and Russia and China, as well as terrorist groups, ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda, so many other groups. We have enormous threats. And vigilance, uh, for liberty and freedom is, is always required. I do respect the fact that the president has stood, has stood tall and called out evil for what it is and named it. I respected that out of Ronald Reagan when Ronald Reagan called out the Soviet Union and called it the evil empire. As a result of the strength that we displayed, as a result of building up our military, uh, working with our allies around the world, putting economic pressure on the Soviet Union, they collapse without firing a shot. I think President Trump is doing what needs to be done to restore our military. We just budgeted, uh, voted for $565 billion for our military, consistent with uh, what his uh, interests and objectives were. But you have to stand up against evil. And if you are uh, only willing to uh, back up and defer and apologize and, and uh, hope they'll just go away, that never happens. And we need to be able to always stand strong. And strength is what preserves freedom. As, as I am with uh, different heads of state, uh, I was in Israel last week. I chair our Congressional Task Force on Terrorism. I met with Prime Minister Netanyahu and many other Israeli officials. And they're so grateful for a president who calls out terrorism for what it is, who calls out Iran for what it is, and will stand up against them. So we have a challenge in North Korea. I was in Japan about six months ago, and uh, we have a major deployment of missile defense systems going from there throughout the Pacific Rim. I thank God every day for Ronald Reagan who had the vision and commitment to establish our missile defense system. If you recall, 
at Reykjavik when he was negotiating the arms treaty with Gorbachev. Gorbachev demanded that he not proceed ahead with missile defense system. And Ronald Reagan uh, walked away. The world scorned him for walking away from this uh, historic opportunity to reduce missiles. And six months later or so, Gorbachev came back to the table. We have missile defense today because of that. So that is a very important part of our defense. We need to rebuild our military. We saw what's happened in the Navy. That was all because of the sequester cuts, uh, much related to that. Uh, I deeply respect your sons. I go to Reed, um, Walter Reed Hospital. I, I see them around the world. We have the most brave, valiant, courageous, wonderful men and women who protect us. And they deserve our support. And without them, we would not be able to carry the lamp of freedom. So God bless you. Yes, sir. This gentleman right here. Okay, you got yes. it. Sure. Okay, um, I have a number of things. Um, I'm going to put them in priority. Okay, first of all. Hold it a little closer to it, okay? Okay, the um, uh, Republican health care bill, you know, if you listen to the mainstream media, they say that the, that the Republican plan is going to make rates go up for senior citizens. I am a senior citizen, and I'd like to know. Okay. Secondly, how how do you stand on a flat tax? Uh, I was talking to someone yesterday, and I said, you know, if 10% was good enough for God, why are we, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, going with 38%? It worked well, didn't it? You know, do people who want tax reform and don't want the rich taxed, uh, do they use the highways more? Do they use the police more? Why should they pay more? Why not just have a flat tax? Now, you're going to help me just bullet points. Uh, Health care, uh, we believe uh, in the long term, the rates will go down for everybody. Uh, there'll be an initial spike uh, for the first year, but then they will go down. And that's our projections, and we believe that that's consistent. Uh, tell me your next one. Yeah, I, I, I'd love a flat tax. I think a flat tax is equitable and fair. I think you... Uh, uh, do not tax those uh, lower incomes, and uh, you provide them a tax-free zone. You have to come up with what that threshold would be, but it's a minimal amount for people who are really in the poverty level. But uh, uh, I, I think a fat tax is extremely fair. I don't know that we can pass that, but we're going to pass a simplified tax that you can file your returns yourself, uh, even on a piece of paper, some say a postcard. It needs to be very simple. It needs to be very clear. It needs to be fair for everyone. There's about 10,000 attorneys in Washington right now who are seeking special carve-outs for certain people. You've got, you know, a trillion dollars worth of uh, carve-outs in our tax code. The tax code is about uh, 80,000 pages. It's bigger than the Bible, but none of the good news. Okay? We've got to fix the tax code. We've got to simplify it. And it needs to be fair for everybody, and it's not today. Next point. Yeah. I, I, I believe respectfully we should in every, in every way. Uh, I think this man was a patriot who helped us. Sure. I, we... we Pursue that, and I will absolutely am for that. Next. The, the last thing was okay. just a comment. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Who's next? This gentleman right here. Congressman, thank you so much for being here. Sure. My name is Stephen Davis. I'm a nine-year Air Force disabled veteran. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your service. I served during Desert Storm, and I am a resident of Indian Trail. My question to you is this. Twice recently, you have spoken in opposition to Black Lives Matter. I want to know what threat does this group, uh, it, what perceived threat does this group pose to you and to the public? Because I think the only thing that, the, that Black Lives Matter is asking for is to be heard and equality. Thank you. 
thank you again. I respect your service and I respect your question. I came out the very first day I spoke very harshly condemning the white supremacists and the KKK, unequivocally. What they did was abhorrent. What they did was wrong. Uh, well, all right, let's bring clarity to that too then. All right. uh, you're referring to the comments made uh, during the Charlotte riots. There was a young man on CNN, an African-American young male, and he made a statement that he hated all white people. I uh, repeated that. I frankly just should have just left it alone. But I repeated the statement that he made. Well, you know, the way the media works sometimes, they construe it as though I made the statement. You can go back and look at the CNN clips. That was my seventh media interview that day of national interviews. This happened to be the BBC. And they chose to kind of clip it the way they wanted. And uh, I, I repeated the statement another man made. I, in fact, I said on in the statement, I looked at his eyes, I saw no hope. A man who was angry, he had no opportunity for education, he had no opportunity for a good job, a future. And that's what I was really crying out for and recognizing in his demeanor. Uh, that unfortunately wasn't picked up and uh, I regret that very much. I think in instances where there has been violence, uh, we need to recognize and acknowledge it. And, you know, I respect the work of Martin Luther King. I worked, you may not know this, uh, very close with a man named E.V. Hill after the riots in South Central Los Angeles in the early 1970s to rebuild that community. And um, I know what it takes to uh, rebuild a uh, a culture and confidence among races, and it's very challenging today. But I think we'll never do that unless we each take the log out of our own eye, whatever that is, and I'm not relating anything to do with white supremacy or black lives matter. I'm not putting anything on the same level at all. But I think there needs to be an honest dialogue, and there needs to be an honesty to call out um, when either Black Lives Matter or Atifa. Atifa, I'm sure you've read about them. They advocate violence. That's, you know, in their commission, that's what they're about doing. And it's wrong. And we can never have a constructive, meaningful uh, work uh, in terms of with races when we have that type of perspective. I, I appreciate the spirit of Martin Luther King. I, I wish in all respects that that was true today. Well, if you want to wait for the mic, we're, we're not. So, just, I had a, another question lined up, but the five white officers that were targeted in the name of Black Lives Matter, I, let me finish, please. Yes, he did quote it. He kept saying it was. Let me finish, please. Let me finish. Sure. Five respect. white officers during a Black Lives Matter protest where they were chanting, a good cop is a death cop, or a dead cop. What do we want? Dead cops. I think How that needs to be called out. Whatever, any time there's rhetoric like that, on either side. All I'm saying is we both need to be honest. But con both con sides. Congressman, it's, you, you mentioned Antifa too, and, and the mayor of Berkeley, the coward that he is, took him a year to finally announce today that Antifa should be declared as a gang. You can quote him. They come there wearing masks, they bring weapons. This? I agree Antifa and Black Lives Matter cannot be compared to neo-Nazis. Somebody that persecuted millions of innocent people back, there's no comparison. But you cannot sit here and tell me that Black Lives Matter does not advocate violence. At their protest, at Antifa as well, wear masks. If you have nothing to hide and well, you're protesting in the right way, why wear a mask? This is disgusting how the liberal media paints out all these other groups their own specific way to have their own narrative, right? At first it was the Russia story. Now that's dwindling down. What is it? Trump's a racist, right? I'm sick and tired of being called a neo-Nazi or a white supremacist or a white nationalist just because I don't believe in the liberal point of view. It's amazing now because anytime you disagree with somebody, for example, Maxine, everyone's a racist, waiters, disagree with her and she calls you a racist. She called Ben Carson 
a racist? Where does the line get drawn and people like Trump start supporting him, sir? Are, you got Senator Tom Tillich. You've got Senator Lindsey Graham. Guys that are going after our president, why aren't you backing him up more? Because I'll tell you what, if you want to get reelected in a year and a half, that's the train to jump on. Support Trump as much as possible. Because when it comes to 2018, much like these liberals in this room thought the Georgia special election was going to be a rude awakening, wait till 2018 because that's what these people are doing. They're obstructing. They're diverting the main narrative until they could pretty much pull the wool over eyes to 2018 with the hopes of winning back the House in 2018. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate your comment. Uh, what I am trying to provide, if possible, is a civil discussion. And I hope each of you will respect that. Uh, let's, let's proceed ahead in that regard. Everyone is entitled to their opinion. There's a lot of strong emotions inside this room. Uh, I have called out uh, the KKK, the white supremacists. I'm asking that black leadership identify the wrong done by uh, parties related to Black Lives Matter and Antifa, then that that be called out. And uh, I've written, a, frankly, a letter to the editor from the Observer, hope that they'll print it uh, to that end. Uh, I think it's very important. Well, it happened because there was impending destruction, and there was, there was destruction of private property uh, throughout downtown, and I, yes, 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 I'm fully, I just, I think your point was well made, and I think we need to have an honest acceptance of realities out there. Who's the next uh, person? Go ahead. I think we should let all lives matter. It shouldn't be one particular group. I agree with that. Now, that's not to say that black lives don't matter, because they do. White lives matter, blue lives matter. They all matter, and they should matter equally. Okay? Sure. Great. Um, now, speaking of the white supremacists, there's a petition going around that I understand in the House to censure President Trump for the way he walked back his first statement about condemning the white supremacists? Are you supporting him of that? Ma'am, the first day President Trump called the actions uh, bigotry, racism, evil. Okay? Does it, he called it out for what it was. He, he even, then he later named the groups. So uh, I think he has been out there. Uh, people wanted more clear, he got more clear. So I think uh, my position is clear. I think the president made his position clear. Well, I'm not, I'm not a, there's no basis for a, a petition of any kind at all. Absolutely not. We're going to be respectful of process, okay? If you go give her the mic, it'll be your turn now, okay? Exactly at what point in time are Congress and Senate going to start understanding that this president is not uniting anybody? He divides us daily with fake news, fake facts, fake everything but him, and all he does is lie, lie, lie. I am offended that he thinks I'm dumb. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm so glad I went to school. And while I have the mic, Hollywood uses toy guns. NRA perpetuates the use of real weapons that should never be in the hands of our children. But it's okay. Population control. The other thing I would like to say is, is that I am a constituent of yours. I'm a retired mental health professional. And how dare you think it is okay to give a mentally ill person weapons. Okay, thank That's you. That's asking for trouble just because what I would like to know, if you were a race car driver and you had a jacket on, 
Who owns you? Who's our, who are your sponsors? Thank you for your comment. First of all, uh, you may be aware we have HIPAA laws, and you're probably very much committed to privacy. We have a very difficult time piercing the HIPAA laws. Ask the sheriff about that tonight, if you like. Thank you. Well, that's the problem that we have with that. Be able to determine who has mental ill issues. Okay? You know, ma'am, keep in mind that you have strong opinions about President Trump and people... Regrettably, we're, we're a divided country, and, and respect the fact that people have strong opinions about uh, President Obama, just as strong. In reference to the HIPAA law, there's also something as a, a medical doctor, as an educator, and there's other positions. You are a court mandated reporter and in by law we have the responsibility to report to DCF whatever your state institution is about the behavior that is we see in children we see in the public that warrants concern so if it's a mental health issue and if you do not report it then the also, that person is also at fault. And that's something that happened in Sandy Hook. This, general, this young boy was definitely had mental health issues. Okay, so I understand that. But you can't let it fall through the cracks. We all have responsibility to speak up to and report behaviors that we see worrisome. And that is a way also with HIPAA that you can, you must be responsible and report those behaviors. I'm fully aware of those laws, and I would say to you that yes, there are times when it's not reported, but there's also people who never go through that system and we do not have information about them. Uh, Ma'am, and I'm aware that there are people still who are, who are not identified as such. Next question, okay. Uh, put his mind. Are you in favor for auditing the Federal Reserve? I, I frankly would be in favor of that at this point. I think they're out of control. I think, frankly, the role that they play with the CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, funded them $600 million uh, annually, uh, the most uh, aggressive agency we've ever had in this country, accountable to nobody, not even the President can fire them. There's many aspects of the Fed I think deserve oversight. Okay. I'll consider that. It depends on how we approach it, but I'd sure consider it. Yes, sir. This man right here wants to say something. We'll get to you. Thank you. Didn't see you. Okay. Um, I would just really like you to explain how you can support President Trump in the way that you obviously do and consider him a good person when he's exposed himself right up as a racist in the way that he talked about Mexicans and Hispanics on the day that he said he was going to run, when he spoke about women in the most vile way possible and has shown absolutely no indication that that has changed at all since the day he said it, and he's equated neo-Nazis and white supremacists with people who came to demonstrate against them, despite the fact that he made some statement like you're making about hating white supremacy and not agreeing with not being a neo-Nazi. He did not call them out by name and did not take a stand that would have made, that would have really, that we should demand of our moral leader. How can you defend this man? I think you can look at those individuals. He's fallible. Uh, we are all fallible. We all make mistakes. Uh, at the same time, you look at his constituencies who support him. You would say that 
but no Muslims would ever support him. He went over to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and met with the leaders of 50 uh, Muslim countries. Uh, he has much more engagement. Talk to Kellyanne Conway about his respect for women and the leadership role that women have in his, his company. That's something you choose not to believe, but there are, um, you have created your own paradigm and your own uh, narrative that, uh, that, that, suits, that, that suits your interest. I believe in the president's policies. You know, we had a president this last time who uh, said everything right, it was so smooth and he was so good, but his policies absolutely failed this country. And uh, when you look at our economy, you look at where we are in the world today, and frankly, I'd, I'd rather have a president who gets it right on policies. May not have it right in all the things, how he communicates. Uh, he's a very straightforward type person. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I'm new to North Carolina. Well, I've been Welcome. here about two years, three years. But I want to piggyback on this lady's uh, comment. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you're not familiar with HIPAA, sir, but HIPAA was created... It was originally started by Hillary Clinton, but then when it was it came into effect, it was the basic idea. I'm a doctor. Sure. I've been in private practice, hospitals. Sure. The basic idea of HIPAA was so doctors, so when you went to your doctor's office, they didn't put the chart on the door. Mm -hmm. So no one, because it used to be that you went to your doctor's office and you saw all these charts on the doors and anyone could come out and read it. Mm -hmm. So that was started the basis of HIPAA. And the whole basis of HIPAA was so doctors wouldn't be talking to other doctors that had no relevant information. Uh, so they would just discuss patients' cases. So for you to use HIPAA as the inability to put some gun control measures is indefensible. And the fact is, this is my first town hall meeting, and I have to say, sir, I am very disappointed because so far, you didn't even answer this lady's question, which I thought it was a great question about how are you going to go to make sure that her three children, her three sons in the military are safe? What measures are you planning to put in place? And you start talking about Ronald Reagan back in the 80s. This is, I have to tell you one thing. If this is how you lead, I want to make sure that I knock on every house and that you are voted out next election. Thank you for coming. Appreciate you being here. Ma'am, uh, do I have access to your medical records? Neither does the sheriff, okay? Keep that in mind. It's for you, ma'am. I thought I answered your question. If I didn't, please tell me. But liberty, freedom requires vigilance. We don't know what's going to happen with North Korea, but we know we have to be there and stand strong. And I respect you and I respect your sons. Ma'am, we are going to be there with all of our military assets and with all of our capabilities, with our defense systems as well. But we have to be prepared and the North Korean president needs to know we're willing to do whatever it takes to deter him in his, pro in his provocation. Until the world knows we're going to stand up against evil, they will continue in their provocation. Yeah, my name is uh, Pastor James Brigman. I'm from Richmond County. Last month, I walked to Washington, D.C. I saw a problem with uh, Medicaid. Well, I, I have a daughter who has a special need. She's in a wheelchair. She can't walk. She can't talk. She can't eat. Uh, she never will be able to. But the Medicaid cuts and uh, proposals that I was reading about, I felt like there needed to be some awareness raised for children and adults as well that are like her. So I walked to D.C. about 400 miles. Uh, didn't Pastor, have a problem. tell them, I'm sorry, with the glare I couldn't tell it was you. Tell them how many miles you walked. It's about 400 miles. Right at 400 miles in July, the 100 degree days everybody was complaining about, I was out there walking. I walked about 25 miles a day. Uh, I was asked when I first left, someone, one of the uh, reporters said, well, who are you going to talk to when you get there? I said, I have no idea. I said, I don't have a plan. God said, go. I went. God has a way of opening many doors. 
There's one thing that uh, when I did get there, and I want to thank your office, Congressman, because you sat down, you listened to our concerns, you addressed us and told us your concerns with the Medicaid, uh, which we listened to that, and we appreciate you working with us and, and working into the future. Uh, you know what our plans are and what we would like to see happen, and we appreciate all the work that your office is doing with us. There was another thing that I learned, though, as I walked up there. I mean, I had a lot of love and support for many people, but I also saw a lot of ignorance and hatred. A lot of people say a lot of things in the name of Christianity that's hateful. A lot of people told me I should have had my daughter aborted if I couldn't afford to raise her myself. Mm -hmm. It don't matter how good an insurance you have when you have a special needs daughter. If I would have had some of the best insurance and only had to pay 10% of her premium, before she came home from the hospital, I would have had to pay over $300,000. And I don't know of too many people in this room that could do that. So there are, we understand that there's compromises that need to be made. And it's the same way with all of these other things. I hear people asking for legislation. And as he pointed out, you cannot legislate, you cannot pass laws that will change hatred in people's hearts. Hatred is something that we've got to look at and we have to... We have to find out what it is. And I'm willing, as a pastor, I see a lot of hatred. I see video games, I see children. They come to church and we pick them up six years old. A few weeks ago, when we were talking about going to a strip club, I thought it was a real strip club because in his mind it was reality, but it was some video game that he was playing, Grand Theft or something, some kind of video game. So these things are real. What we put in these children here, we have to take into consideration. The laws that we're asking, him to pass? Are they legitimate? Can they even be passed? Can you pass a law? And if somebody comes up with a law, please tell me, contact me and work with me because we're working on getting it passed. When you come up with a law to take hatred and you come up with a law that can take racism out of people's hearts. I just want to thank you again, Congressman, for all y'all doing with us. And anybody that comes up with a law that can change hatred because that begins at home. That begins in our own hearts. If we start loving people and treating people the way we want to be treated, we'll start seeing change in this country as far as the hatred and the bigotry. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Sweet man, he brought his wife and daughter up to be with us. and Very, very caring, loving individual. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for the leadership that you provide back in your community. This, this lady, have you asked a question yet? We're good. I'm trying to get the everybody new. Hi, Representative Pinger. My name is Ava. Thank you for taking the time to do sure. this. I live in Matthews. My family and I moved from Chicago just over two years ago, mm -hmm. so we know about the gun violence yeah. there. And actually, the ATF reports that in 2014, over 50% of the guns that were confiscated came from other states. In my neighborhood last year, 21 cars were robbed. They were unlocked, unsecured guns. Five handguns were stolen from this one incident. Um, in the um, states that require background checks for handgun sales, 46% fewer women are killed by a gun by their intimate partner. So while you can't legislate hate away, you can certainly do some things to help reduce the violence against women. Um, and on your website, you said that, pardon me, I get nervous talking in front of people. Um, you said that Dylan Roof, unfortunately, that gun was obtained by a, hole, a loophole in the, the background checks. But Representative Clyburn from, from South Carolina, he has a bill that he's introduced last month that will close these loopholes. Right now, it's in the Judiciary Committee. Would you commit to supporting that bill? Chair sure, Kathy, would you like to come up? Yeah, I'd love to have you. I think they, as a law enforcement and the sheriff of this county, I think his perspective would be welcome with each of y'all. It's one thing to hear from a politician. It's one thing to hear from the guy who has to enforce the laws to protect you every day. I, I'm not sure about what he entered in to, the, to try to get passed. I've not seen it. A lot of things I've listened to you talk about, the mental health bill, the pistol permits and things. The only, we, we in North Carolina, uh, have a pretty good record of what 
can be bought, what can be sold. Pistol permits have to be approved by the sheriff. And we check the mental health of every pistol permit, but we can only check it through the clerk's office. And that check determines whether they have been mentally committed or not. Used to, we used to send a, we used to ask for their doctor and send a release to the doctor and the doctor signed that release. All that has changed. We don't, we're not able to do that anymore. And it is due to HIPAA was they restricted our getting the medical information so the only place we can check for me medical or IVCs, involuntary commitments, is the clerk's office in the county where they're applying for the permit. So North Carolina is a pretty unusual state that we, anybody that gets a permit to buy a pistol, we check that. Long guns is a different story. But is that what you're interested in? Uh, yes. It doesn't change anything because we can't check that. We can't. Couldn't check it before the repeal? We Sorry. couldn't check it before the repeal. We can't check anything now but at the clerk of court's office. But could you check it before that law was repealed? Uh, yes. So more people. Before get, that, we were checking everywhere. With, so more people with mental disabilities are able to get their hands on guns now because you can't check Social Security disability records. Is that correct? I'm, I'm, I'm aware not, of that. I'm not talking no, about disability. I'm, I'm aware of that. That's, I'm just talking I'm about the... I'm tacking on to your question. Uh, yes, before we could check, for instance, if you come in and applied for a pistol permit, we would ask you who your family doctor was. You would give us that information. We would sign, uh, write a letter, or you would sign a uh, permission slip for us to get the information, send it to your family doctor, and your family doctor would give us the information. And a lot of them would send your medical records. Same with the VA. We can't do that anymore. But when it comes to the people that are on disability for mental health issues, the government clearly already has that information. The and government now you has just don't that have information, and it. we can check that if we can get it on their computer. We can run their history, and we can get what's available to us, but we can't, like, we can't contact a doctor anymore. Right. No, I understand that. My, my question was about the repeal of the law that allowed you to check Social Security, Social Security disability records. Yes. So did that change? Are more people able, people I'm, that are on disability I, I due to mental health issues? I don't have a good issues? answer to that. I, I, don't, I don't know. Do you know, Congressman? I can't respond to that with clear data. I've heard your question. I, I, I just don't, I don't know the I don't answer want to be that. flippant about the answer. Can I, can I ask, finish the, yep. the answer? Answer your question. So, Megan, yes, these are two separate issues that we're talking about. This is a national bill that would close loopholes in obtaining a gun before, I'm sorry, um, that would close these loopholes that allow Dylan Roof to get the gun that he used in the Charleston church. Would you support this national bill? I need to bill? read the bill. I mean, it's, you can't just give a... Okay, I can't get that information. I, I, I would be glad to look at any bill. I read every bill that proposed up. Sure. You got a person back here. Congressman Pittenger, if you are presented with clear, unam unambiguous evidence that candidate Trump conspired with a hostile foreign nation like Russia and used their espionage to, to assist him in becoming president, will you commit right now to putting the sovereignty and integrity of the United States of America over your personal loyalty to the man Trump and vote to impeach him. <laughs> I will follow the leadership of Mr. Mueller. He has been put in that position and uh, I'm gonna allow him to make an assessment uh, with uh, what should be done, looking at all the facts to date. We haven't seen any facts whatsoever. We've seen conjecture. We've seen people uh, making things up, but we haven't seen any real facts. But we have someone in leadership responsibility. I will follow his judgment. Ambiguous evidence. Will you do that? I'm, I'm going to allow that to be presented 
by Mr. Mueller, and we'll, then we'll make our decision at that point. And that was my question. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for about four or five more. Right here? Right, right here is fine. Whatever. Um, three quick points, Congressman. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that myself as well as everyone else in here, our vote is not given, it's earned, so the things that you say are, are very important to us. Sure. Uh, please be aware of that. Secondly, as far as gun control goes, I think that um, the military has to evaluate someone's mental condition before they're able to take up arms within the military. Why can't that be applied in the civilian sector? And uh, I, would, I would like that to be. I would, I would like us to have more application of mental health inside uh, the who receives a gun. And, and third, you mentioned Martin Luther King earlier when mm -hmm. I spoke of Black Lives Matter. Um, I don't know if you remember or not, but Dr. King was attacked by dogs and he was uh, shot with water hoses, all for the same form of protest. So I would just suggest that and he was you just, and just use caution when invoking Dr. King because he, he revisionist history paints him in a different light than the way he was painted during, during his lifetime. Well, by some people, I would say to you that uh, people like Billy Graham opened up crusades uh, like, and opened up the country. A lot of people did a lot, yes. There are French people out there who do a lot of hurt and harm. And that's what we have in our country in the division. Uh, I, I don't accept that. And I work to try to eliminate that. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say, I was a proud Marine Corps officer. And I proud. served in the Marine Corps well, as you. an officer. Good. And one of the first things that we learned, and when I took my oath, you know, my commissioning oath, mm -hmm. it was very important to me. But one of the first lessons that I learned was that you lead by example. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's my biggest problem. Everybody in my family serves. It's what we do for our country. It's just expected of us, mm -hmm. men, or women, men and women. And so I'm a little confused when I look at our leadership and I don't see the same level of leading by example. And I'm speaking specifically by my president. Sometimes when he talks, I don't even know if he's pushing the same values that I put my life on the line for. And that really dismays me. And then luckily I see people like Senator Tillis, Senator Graham, and I think, yes, and Senator McCain. And I think, yes, and I hope to add you to that list of people that I hold in high regard, but I'm not a party ideologue. I just expect a certain caliber of service from my elected officials. And so far, I've seen a dearth of it in my commander-in-chief. And it's very concerning to me. I meet with our military around the world. And they are so grateful for a president who understands the mission, who is committed to the defeat of Islamic terrorism, who understands the threat of Iran, who understands where we caved in and gave him $150 billion. We took a country that was a garden snake and made him a bow constrictor. It was the worst agreement, the PC, the, the agreement uh, with Iran that we signed this past year. Uh, the, the impact of that is going to be extraordinary. They have been the greatest supporter of terrorism for 30 years. They've enabled Hamas, Hezbollah, Samaritans. He is calling this out. He's calling out North Korea. He's calling out the provocation of other countries. And they respect the fact that now we have a leader who is committed, as General Mattis is, a great soldier. He is allowing General Mattis to lead the war in Syria and Afghanistan and not lead it from the Oval Office, from a political point of view. So I will say to you, ma'am, 
our military has great respect for the leadership of Donald Trump and what he's doing to secure this country and protect your life. Ma'am, in all due respect, 50 Muslim countries came to meet with him in Riyadh. Uh, the 50 countries came to meet with him in Riyadh, Muslim countries. Uh, don't jump to these conclusions, please. You want to ask me one more question? Let me let you. In the past, you uh, called for a term limit of three terms, but now you're running for your fourth. How do you justify that? Well, uh, I agreed to the fact that I never said three terms. I said, if there was a term limit bill, I would be glad to sign it. But uh, let me say to you, let me give you some thought about term limits. Keep in mind that since 2010, two-thirds of the Congress is gone. They have been term limited. They are out. All right? And the power in Washington, D.C. is not in your, you know, member of Congress, your typical average member of Congress. It's in the committee chairman. They have the power. And in the House of Representatives, what we've done is limit their power. A committee chair can only serve for six years, and then they have to come out as committee chair. They can accumulate all that power. So, unfortunately today, we have four legs of our government. We have the executive branch, we have the legislative branch, we have the judicial branch, and we have the bureaucracy. Very aggressive, assertive people in our agencies who have taken them, who have been empowered by laws to go around the Congress. And the more you allow those people to circumvent the Congress, the more out of control your representation is. No, sir, they're really not. The lobbyists are another factor, but. No, these are agencies that maybe you just aren't aware of the impact of the CFPB and all that came out of the Dodd-Frank Act, even the Health Care Act. You have the empowerment of agencies. You have empowerment of agencies. What we are trying to do is bring back Article I so that your representatives are empowered to manage our government and not unelected bureaucrats. You want to be respectful? Ma'am, I have town halls every August. This is when I do town halls. Most members of Congress aren't doing any town halls. I have them every August. Come back next August, we'll have another one. All right, who's got another question? We've Thank got you. time for a couple more, then we're going to call tonight. Thank you. Uh, I would like to direct my question to uh, the sheriff, if he's here, and our other uh, police officers. I have a, a great respect for police officers. I've, taught for 12 years on the south side of Chicago. I teach in uh, Charlotte Meg schools now, and I work very closely with them. And I'm hoping for an answer. If you could put a number on, generally speaking, of course, the number of legally bought firearms that are stolen out of garages, cars, boats, wherever, versus the number of legally bought firearms that successfully defend a family. I would like to know the number versus the other number. I, I can't give you a number, but I would tell you the legally bought guns are far more than what's stolen out of the homes and cars. Uh, and we're fortunate in this county, but it is uh, the number of guns stolen are, are, are way far less than what's bought. Uh, if they're illegally stolen, are they reported? If they're an illegal firearm, do you, they come to you and say, hey, someone stole my illegal well, gun? Well, I don't know what you call an illegal firearm. There's no registration for long guns in the state of North Carolina, so every long gun is legal. Uh, handguns are not registered to, to the individuals. The only registration for a handgun is when it is bought, and it's not, not registered to the individual. So there's very few illegal handguns in the possession of people some that have been reported stolen. Okay, how, then maybe the second part of my question. How many people successfully defend their house or their family using a, I guess any gun? It seems like they're all pretty much legal. Uh, 
I don't have a number on it, but not a lot. It's not a big number, but we do have, have that, yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you see a problem with these guns being funneled to, say, Chicago? Many of my students were shot with guns that came from out of state, whether it was 10 feet over the border or 750 miles down here to Charlotte. I'm sure that that is a legitimate statement that a lot of guns come from other places into Chicago because they, they pay more money because they can't buy legal guns. So a gun that costs $500 in North Carolina costs $1,500 in Chicago. And they steal them in North Carolina, take them to Chicago. So if this is a national problem, don't we as a nation need to stop providing guns to places like Chicago? or New York, or Baltimore, or the other cities that Mr. Pittenger likes to keep bringing up in his sound bites. Well, I think Is that's it not our responsibility to prevent people from having those guns? I think you've got a legitimate point, but I think uh, uh, you have to weigh on what you've got. Chicago, uh, it, it works the other way just as well. Uh, allow Chicago people to buy their own guns in Chicago in the same marketplace, they have the same thing. Uh, if they're paying $500 in Chicago for the gun you're paying $500 in North Carolina for, then there's no point to steal a gun in North Carolina to take to Chicago. We can go back and forth all day. And I, and I do respect I you, sir. I do, I'm, I do. I'm not coming after you. But with gun restrictive laws in Chicago, it seems like, or other cities, I'm just using that as an example because it used to be my hometown, but the, should we not... If we're thinking of the nation as a whole, the good of the nation, people on our next door across the fence or people that are poor in Chicago, should we not help keep the guns off those streets there? And I, think, I, I can see we're just going to go back and forth a little bit, but I, don't, I think I don't my point is I don't think we disagree made. at all, but what to, how to answer that, I don't have an answer for it. Uh, you know, Chicago's altogether different area than North Carolina is or any city in North Carolina. So I don't know how the laws in North Carolina affect Chicago. I agree that something needs to be done about the, the high crime rate in Charlotte and sure. Chicago and other places. But to penalize the people in North Carolina to help the people in Chicago, I think you have to talk about that right much. But if they're not saving, if they're not saving their lives, if people are buying guns and then losing them and buying another gun, and those guns are winding up in the wrong hands, and we have seen uh, many more murders in Charlotte this year than we have in previous years, if those, hand, if those guns are winding up in the long ha wrong hands, shouldn't we stop the flow at the, you know, the top of the spigot? Would well, you rather have fewer handguns on the let's street? Let's do this. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank Continue you. Continue the conversation. <laughs> Thank you we for getting me you, off the hook. We've got the sheriff here, uh, Tanner, Linda, Chris, Bob, Tom. Uh, we are available. Uh, our team is, if you've got further questions, or particularly if you have constituent need issues, uh, we're available to be with you. I do appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you, and God bless you.